Um, welcome then again to our uh, showcase demo session for cohort V9, the final responsibility that you have related to Launchpad V9, and then you are free into the into the space. We launch you into the uh, the network, um, as we say at the end of this. Um, we've got a little introduction. Then we'll have your your project or demos. A um, couple shout outs at the end, and then um, then you graduate. Yay! You'll see already in the in the right hand corner of your screen. There's a um, a QR code um, that will link you to a voting form. I'll talk a little bit more about this as we go, and I'll remind you of it as we go as well. Um, but that QR code links to a form. Um, where you get to vote uh, for a couple of awards. Uh, I think the awards come in the form of swag um, and they range from like most technical contributions, most impactful contributions, best collaborative effort, uh, most creative projects. So um, we'll have time at the end to vote, but this QR code will appear uh, throughout the deck. And so if you you know, see a presentation and you're like, wow, that that's super creative. I love it. I'm going to go vote. Um, you can scan that QR code. It'll also be linked uh, on the last slide. I think there's the um, the Google form link. All right. As a recap, you already know this, but um, on the left hand side is just a bit about what we have accomplished over the past four weeks. Hopefully we've hit some of these goals that the, uh, we as a Launchpad team have where we were trying to scale the protocol lab networks to new opportunities um, that new contributors have joined, that you've been onboarded and that you feel like we've built a bit of a community here and connected you to the larger protocol lab network community. We're now on that list on the right, cohort V9, February 2023. We had 29 participants from across 10 different orgs in the network. For those of you who were with us in Denver, this was our group photo. Um, I think we had nice weather. We had, we had nice weather most of the time there. I know it was a little chilly, but um, it wasn't that bad. A um, couple of snaps from the week that our photographer had uh, had shared with us as we were, this might've been just before, just after the group photo, hanging out on the deck at the hotel. And we've got a little video here from the week, which I'm gonna play. actually seen the latest update of that that's awesome uh really nice video um and I, our videographer i think his name was chris i hope i'm not getting that wrong um craig craig, craig, craig thanks yeah. alexa um yeah craig was there for a few days uh, that's a, that's a fun product um these are great to have great memories of um a really awesome week together in um in denver all right let's begin the showcase all right, um, these are the directions that I think you all followed. Um, there, Don't worry about that three to five slides. Uh, I know uh, there were some questions about that. Um, you can fly through as many slides as you can in the allotted five minutes. Um, and I'll give you a warning then to wrap up around five minutes. Um, and let's get into this. I'm really excited to see uh, how, these, how these projects evolve from when we last shared about them. Um, at our show me what you've got so far or our showcase so far I should say um which was the last thing we did in Denver um during Cola week let's start with uh David's formal proof of source um David you can uh 
jump in here and and uh, and take it away. Yeah, so this is kind of an extension. We were working on a um, a grant proposal with FVM to create this like reproducible build container. So like a way to 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 make to homogenize builds um, for source code that's going to be deployed on FVM. And I was thinking like that's kind of cool, but like you have to do that every time. And if you want to verify any source code, it's like a one-off operation that you have to do locally. Like what if there was a, a blockchain that did this um, source code verification and had all the attributes of a blockchain. So it was like distributed, it was transparent, it was verifiable. So kind of like decided to noodle around on a, a POC where um, source code stored in IPFS the, the thinking is, is like store source code in IPFS, have compiled source code that's stored on the FVM chain, um, and then be able to, with a CID and an address, be able to say that this source code matches um, this compile code. And that's all really technical. If you're not technical, I, uh, let me give you a little like idea of like, when you're looking at a contract and you're auditing a contract um, to say like, I'm going to use this. Uh, I want to make sure it's like valid and it does what I want it to do. You, you view the source code to do that. But there's no real way to say that the source code I'm looking at is the source code that's actually on the chain. And that's extremely problematic uh, because um, you could be auditing something that isn't valid. So this is a way of like um, making auditing contracts that already exist on FEM um, valid. And this is kind of like a separate blockchain um, that does this as part of its transaction process. Um, yeah, so that that's it in a nutshell. Uh, maybe we advance the slide one once, once more. Yeah. So um, I have a build of this. It's like eighty percent done, so I can't demo it right now. But it's actually like a working blockchain where you submit transactions uh, of the CID and address, and it does this formal verification. And then you can query the chain at any time to say, does this source code match up? So you can envision like on the source code, you have like a little badge that says a verify build um, that's on the source code itself. Like it could be in GitHub, a GitHub badge or something like that. So there's a lot of kind of cool ramifications. It's it's definitely like extra architecture um, for this, but it's it's also kind of like, um, I think would be a cool appendage as like the Filecoin virtual machine matures a little bit and uh, is like looking for like additional architectures that um, can provide verification. Awesome. Thanks, David. We've got Sharp Shark and Valeria next. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, guys, that's me. So first of all, let me tell you about uh, Sharp Shark. Uh, we help businesses to protect and monetize their textual, visual, and other copyrightable content. Uh, for that, we create proof of authorship, track its usage over the internet, and uh, let the um, copyright owner know about possible violations and uh, help uh, deal with them. For example, if you are Coin Telegraph, uh, that was one of our biggest clients, and uh, you have articles and you want to be on the top in uh, Google search first, and also you want to have as uh, many views as possible because you sell ads, we come handy, you create proof of authorship uh, that is compatible with the European and US legislation, thanks to I IPFS in part. Um, with the Shapshire, then we track uh, if somebody used your article without backlinks, even if it's rewritten, and let you know if something's wrong. And if you don't like it, we help you to generate um, or to generate a claim, and that claim goes to either site provider or Google custom search, and they like must reply because we are compatible with the law. When we um, entered Protocol Labs network for us, uh, uh, so basically it's like fundamental technology that allows uh, yeah, the like um, implementation of copyright law using uh, DLT, so digitally native, and for us, it was like, okay, we wanted to write a book, and English alphabet said, okay, guys, you are cool, like, uh, I'm going to support you. So that's what we do. Next slide. 
Uh, uh, recently, so you know, when we started uh, Launchpad, uh, we had uh, another project in mind to become uh, like to go to more trustless and uh, decentralized uh, um, a space uh, using like different types of services and stuff. But uh, we stumbled upon another um, legislative moments, and uh, we are still discovering whether we can we can do that or not. Uh, but like of course we are working on the product and uh, this was like the three latest things that we implemented so basically we view us uh, as a mean to navigate the tons of content because especially with ai generated content the, there will be only more and more of it on the web and uh, uh, the silly way is to restrict it, like don't use AI, don't use calculators, uh, as um, it was that protest of uh, math teachers when cal calculator was invented in 19th century. No, we just need a means to tell whether that piece of content is quality or not quality, and um, this is our uh, vision. So recently, uh, we uh, uh, taught IPFS to understand Unicode and pros and remove markdown. That's super important because uh, copyrighted pieces, in order to be like copyrighted, they like the form matters. Uh, also, uh, we taught our application to tell whether content is human or AI generated. And uh, we are not against AI generated content. We just want uh, if uh, we just want to show how unique it is. Uh, for example, my chat GPT writes in my tone tone of voice already because I taught it and like that that's that's cool. And also we recently implemented Creative Commons licensing in our uh, interface, uh, and uh, we also see that uh, it would come uh, in handy in future. Next slide. So uh, our future plans, uh, basically, we want to, um, um, we see that every content web website should have a widget to check the originality of the content and uh, to protect the newly created one. So super seamless and stuff, we are going to create a widget for that. And uh, also, we are thinking about creating marketplace uh, where content is that is eligible for distribution can be basically easily uh, accessed. Uh, for example, uh, mid journeys generated content and, and the like and stuff, they uh, are generated under Creative Commons license. And uh, we need a convenient place to store it so we have pretty nice cloud storage <laughs> that we can use for that. Uh, right now, calculating the um, reason uh, whether it's reasonable or not to do it. And yeah, so moving to the, um, there should be another slide and I forgot about it. Our vision is to become IP Oracle, but for content and yeah, moving there. That's great. Um, I think this is going to be a really, I don't. It feels like it's going to be a really important part of, the, you know, this sort of verifying um, and and copywriting and and authorship um, and awarding creators with, um, you know, the the rewards that they deserve. I think it's going to be a, an interesting space. Um, there's a, a a member in the the next cohort in V10 who um, has a a law background and works with the Filecoin Foundation. And just yesterday in Molly's protocol labs, um, intro to protocol labs or the deep dive into protocol labs network, um, the discussion veered towards like AI created artwork. And the artwork is being created in the style of historically famous or currently famous artists. Um, so the questions arise like, well, does the artist who has inspired the AI get rewarded for that creation and it's a you know it's this whole space mm -hmm. of copyright and and uh, like I said authorship um that I think is going to be an interesting one to monitor how it all evolves in the near future so um it seems like an exciting space to be um uh, and an important one as well yeah totally totally second that yeah so happy to be here. Would be happy to connect with those guys because I'm also working with Filecoin Foundation. We yeah, also yeah. launched the product fully yeah. the other day. So yeah, I can give you an introduction. Mm -hmm. 
Cool. cool. Thanks. All right. Let's move on to uh, the next one. We've got Matthew next with hash fingerprint visualization. Cool. So um, uh, for mine, I uh, basically spent, I would say this is like 75% more educational for me, 24% uh, project and 1% emoji. Um, so I'm going to go through these super quick. So first, a uh, quick reminder, uh, for, you know, if you want to rewind a few weeks uh, to when we were doing the IPFS content, we all learned about hashing. So hashing is this mathematical process. You take an arbitrary piece of content or a message, you put it through an algorithm and you get a value out uh, of a fixed length. Uh, if you recall, that's where SIDs come from in IPFS. Um, it is just the hash of content. Um, one of the really interesting things about hashing is this thing called the avalanche effect, whereas you make a very small change to the input, you get a very large change in the output. And so as a result, you can treat the outcome of that as a unique fingerprint um, of it. So one of the things that's interesting about that is that's really useful going in that forward direction, going from content to a hash. But if you're trying to do the opposite, Humans are really bad at recognizing. So really quick, like unmute, shout out. Are these the same or different? Are these hashes the same or different? Don't cheat, just look at them. I'm gonna say quick, this. Quick, same. quick. Same, same. Same. Oh, wait, I see a difference. <laughs> okay, now, same same question. Same or different? Uh, different. 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 Second one was easier, right? Yeah. 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 So. Humans are really good at looking at visual pictures, but not good at looking at strings of numbers and letters. So there have been various visual hashes designed for that purpose. So if you wanna say, you know, like the example I gave when we were doing the, the previous one was like, when I'm cutting and pasting a Filecoin address to transfer a Filecoin, I'm terrified every time that I'm gonna get something wrong. And so how do you know that you're sending it to the right place? And so there've been a bunch of visual hashes designed um, one of the things that I think is problematic with these is you have to have an image library that can generate an image that's not going to be the same. Um, you know, a lot, and a lot of these, by the way, I looked at the open source projects for these, they're basically abandoned where they like require, a, you know, a version of PHP from 2016 and stuff like that. So um, I looked back into the past and found uh, some of you have used SSH, uh, you might have seen this little grid in the past, which is the ASCII based uh, visualization for an open SSH key. Um, and I was curious to see how that worked and apply it to Falcon. Uh, I'm going to do like a super, super fast version of this because this is more technical. The very short version is you have an arbitrary grid, you go through all the bytes of the information that you want to fingerprint. In the case of open SSH, that's the public key. Um, for every two bits uh, and you know a bit one or zero. So if you have two bits, you have four possible outcomes. For every two bits, you either go northwest, northeast, southwest, you go diagonal in one direction. Um, if you hit the edge, you slide. Every time you stop, you leave a marker. And there that table at the bottom shows you like the ASCII version of in theory, it was supposed to be the lines got thicker. I don't know if it really looks that way, but you know, end effect. Uh, this is what that looks like going through a fingerprint. I'm going to skip past this in the interest of time, but this is basically how you would do it mathematically. This is a visualization uh, that someone, not me, made of like what that looks like to generate these. Um, so if you wanted to do that for Filecoin, um, this is how a Filecoin address is calculated. I love them. And um, the portion that we're concerned about is this portion. This is basically... A, going back, it is a hash of the public key, and that generates 20 bytes. So if we took those same 20 bytes, ran them through that same thing, we could generate that same sort of ASCII-based visual outcome. Uh, I wanted to play around with it a bit. So what I did was now getting to the project, I wrote this library that will apply, you can take an arbitrary dimension, it doesn't have to be nine by 17, and you can take arbitrary tile sets. And so throw in some emoji. Uh, and so, I went for some spacey themed emoji to fit all of the PL, you know, galaxy things. Uh, and that's, that's what it looks like. This is what it does. It works ish. You can take a Filecoin address and get something output like that. Uh, here are three different Filecoin F1 addresses. Um, you can see they look fairly different. 
uh, in this thing. Uh, it looks nice in dark mode. I think it looks a little better. Um, and a mock-up of what that might look like applied to like a ledger device. So, you know, you know that you're transferring it to the thing you go to. Um, if you've ever done this procedure and you're trying to look at like 20 alphanumeric characters on your ledger, it's not fun. Um, so uh, that's it. If I was to go further with it, um, I would probably want someone who has better visual sensibilities to me to tweak the tile set. I pick those emoji really quickly, um, but if you were to pick some different ones, play with them, play without, but you could probably get something that looked better um, and someone should probably port it to JavaScript so it can be done on a web page. Um, yeah, but that's the, the short version. And uh, bonus in the last 10 seconds, as I was doing this, I needed to generate a bunch of quote unquote fake or real file client addresses. So um, here's a file client address that's I generated. If you enhance that, you'll see the first characters are my user ID. And so bonus software drop, if you want to make vanity Filecoin addresses for burner addresses, uh, I have some software for that now too, you can grab there. And if you want to test that that works, the best way is to take that address and send a lot of Filecoin to that address. And I promise I'll put it to good use. That's it. Awesome, thanks a lot, Matthew. Um, that was cool. Uh, I like that mock-up you did with the phone and devices and, uh... Yeah, and I mean, the project overall, very creative. Um, lots of uh, positive responses in the chat as you were talking there. Um, very cool. Okay, next up we have Fillet. And um, we've got the largest collaborative effort coming up next of this cohort. Um, Laura, Kyle, Janelle, Naomi, Brandon, and Chris. Um, I will turn it over to that team. Hi, everybody. Uh, we are Fillet. This was the great logo that was made by our awesome uh, Chris Garcia. I am Chanel, and our team members are. Uh, if you if you guys want to quickly say hi. Hello. And hi. yeah. Hello. <laughs> and so we are Fillet. We want to empower your workforce with uh, Fillet. Our Web three recruitment made easy. Next slide, please. And so at the beginning of the year, the recruitment team transitioned to not only recruit for like internal PL roles, but also for our network companies. And so putting all the roles together uh, created the world's largest Web3 job board. And so we really want to expand upon this and combine like the best Web2 elements of hiring services like LinkedIn, Hired, and other talent marketplace products, but also keep privacy data ownership in mind or like top of mind. And so we're already trying to work through this with our current applicant tracking system, which is Greenhouse, um, by like sharing candidate authorization forms that allow us to share um, a candidate's profile across multiple companies. And there are already some crypto native work platforms that have some niche elements, but we really want to create a platform that can service both the client, the company side, and um, like the candidate side. And so um, we already currently, you know, support a bunch of network companies, but from a recruiting perspective, and everyone does it like a little bit differently. Um, and so having an all-in-one applicant tracking system like this could really help us and other future companies, uh, like Web3 companies, uh, navigate through recruiting efforts more efficiently. And also on the other side, this tracking system can also act as like a sourcing method where candidates can actively update their profiles, communicate with recruiters, keep track of all their interviews all in one place without having to search their inboxes with thousands of emails. And so we're really just trying to create like an all-in-one platform for, you know, how there's one for productivity. We're just trying to create one for recruiting as well. And so we're the way we are thinking of it is we want to make a platform where Tinder, LinkedIn, and AngelList had a baby and was raised in Web3. All right. This is Laura here. So this is probably one of the roughest Figma boards I've ever created. Probably my first and last time creating one. Um, but so it's pretty straightforward. Um, we imagine that the homepage that the candidates would see is pretty much a list of all of the roles from a bunch of different companies, and they would have the ability to swipe left or right, kind of similar to Tinder. Um, and also, I think one of the big things is to have like the most flexible filter options because people are always looking for different things. 
Um, and then the profile page is where candidates would include their website, LinkedIn, or any of their pro portfolios. They would also indicate what tech stacks they prefer, location, and salary preferences. And all of these um, can be hidden or made public by the user. Um, and then over to the next screenshot is the applications page where all of the roles that they apply to or role, uh, applications that they started or saved, they would all kind of just compile in that section. Um, and then to the next is the calendar section where they can filter out certain criteria and look for all of the interviews that they're going through. And then um, you, there is also an option where it can show them what stage they're currently at. So if they are in offer stages, it will clearly indicate that. And then um, from the recruiting side, we would be able to send out the offer letter through that. And in that system, the candidate would be able to open up the offer letter, view it, accept it or decline it, et cetera. Um, and then down below to the very left is the messaging screenshot where candidates would be able to interact with the recruiters. And also if, you know, if there's any inappropriate languages that are exchanged, then they would be able to report on both ends and in my imagination, I presume that the messaging function can eventually be disabled so that they can, um, I guess, avoid reaching out to each other. And if they want to revert that, they would have to go through a whole process. Um, and then there is the company page where they can follow or unfollow companies and they can also expand that company page to see what they're about, um, what roles that they have open, um, maybe some information about the company culture, et cetera. And then the last two screenshot is mostly for the candidate. Um, they have the profile page and also recruiters would be able to see this profile for sourcing purposes. Um, but that's only if the user keeps those fields public, of course. Um, and then the profile settings is where they can opt in or out to allow recruiters to reach out to you. If you, for example, swipe left on one of the roles in the homepage, um, and then it would also give users the ability to hide any of their info and, you know, display certain parts of their profile public, if that makes sense. All right. So... From the client side of this, so like a hiring manager, recruiter um, that's working on a team, things like that, we envision this to be sort of like um, like a LinkedIn page, uh, like company page with the ability to add rich media, maybe um, have a showcase through uh, some <laughs> front page or whatnot, showcase some specific roles and whatnot. Um, and then the actual kind of profile them or profile and, and platform themselves for the client will they'll be allowed to like post their roles and look for what find out what they're looking for things like that. Um, in addition, we'll look at things like a sourcing platform, so to speak. So like think about like uh, if you were to search for profiles on LinkedIn, how they come up, and some of those things that Laura just talked about. Um, as far as like the ability to opt in and out of um, certain parameters or whatnot will show up for employers. And just as um, as the kind of employers can can star profiles, candidate profiles for uh, the same way candidates can star the profiles um, at the uh, the company stage. So then we can kind of create a curated list of matching profiles, as well as like if you want to kind of go degrees off of that as well. Um, and then kind of talk, uh, I think Naomi's going to talk a little bit about the kind of workflow and scheduling through and things like that. Yeah, um, thanks for that, Brandon. So yeah, um, and similar to kind of the, um, uh, the candidate facing one, um, we really want to make it very easy for clients to navigate. So whether they're a recruiter or a hiring manager, they will be able to view candidate profiles um, and 
everything will be on there. So their LinkedIn resume, GitHub, recruiter notes, interview stage, where they're at in the process. Um, we'll be able to message candidate directly. So as a recruiter, we could message the candidate um, directly um, or a hiring manager could message a recruiter directly um, or the candidate as well. Um, um, we'll be able to view just different roles the candidate has applied for, um, view the pipeline of like um, how many candidates are in the process, where they're at in the process, um, and also be able to have a, cal a calendar view of like just upcoming um, interviews like that the hiring team may have or the recruiter may have. Um, and then just review applications um, and very easy to reject or move, move forward with the candidate, um, kind of like swiping right or left. Um, and overall, it's, you know, our goal is just to make a platform that's very easy and beneficial for whether for everyone to use. So whether you're a recruiter, candidate or a hiring team, um, this is going to be the platform, the all in one platform that we're trying to um, showcase. Um, so yeah, um, any questions? I think that's everything. Um, anyone else wants to add anything else? All right. So now we, we've got a uh, we've got the prototype, but we need builders. So uh, investors, possibly you. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, team. Yeah. Shark Tank. Here we go. Um, awesome. Yeah, I think I mean, it seems I was thinking during that, like, is there any app based thing like this? I mean, in like Web 2, even, you know, like I've everything I've seen has always been web based. I, I mean, I know like you can you can get LinkedIn and stuff on your phone. There are those apps, but not, I haven't seen it as thought out as this in terms of that like hiring process, um, which seems like there's an opportunity there. Um, cool. I'm excited to see where this goes. All right, following up next, we've got <clears throat> the other collaborative uh, effort of this cohort, which is Antonio and Caitlin with their Web3 Noobs community. Uh, possible <laughs> investor, yeah, maybe you know. <laughs> All right, hey everyone. Hi everyone, um, I'm Antonio. This is Caitlin with me, and um, we feel Web3 Noobs. And so we created a community so everyone can learn and collaborate uh, with people that don't feel too tech savvy and just wanted to share some knowledge and collaborate with everyone. Uh, everyone we feel can bring something to the table and sometimes the outside perspective, it's the best problem solver. So that's why we created this community so everyone can improve each other. And if you are a technical contributor, don't stop listening. It's not just for noobs. Um, we're hoping to bring in technical folks as well that love to share, collaborate, teach. Um, so it is like a very um, well-rounded community. Yeah. And we decided for a community to go for a community because we believe it's the best way to learn and improvise and, and to just get the results and the transformations that you want to get and to just achieve new heights with your work. And so when um, forming the community, we wanted to make sure it was very beneficial for members. It is, wasn't just another community to join and not participate in. So the benefits to members will be really strong curated content um, coming from third parties and also user generated. Um, building new connections with people all over the world, not you know just within the PLN, but um, even broader scope. Um, and then just hopefully providing endless opportunities for conversations and collaborations um, within Web3. Yeah, and we created some community guidelines, like most of the Web3 and even on the PL network. Uh, be supportive and share generously. I feel and we feel like that's the way to just improve everything. Just be supportive of each other and just share your knowledge and learn by listening what you what everyone's saying. Be constructive with everyone's doing and lift each other, lift each other up. I, think, I feel like that's the best way how to work. And just the, the most common one, just don't spam it because, you know, <laughs> let's just keep building. Not helping anyone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so there are quite a few options um, as far as platforms to build on. You have your discords, um, which is a great, great option, but a lot of people are already there. Slack, Telegram, 
um, we wanted to kind of remove this community from the noise and create a more um, calm, safe, inclusive space for people to collaborate and contribute. And so we landed on Mighty Networks um, for a few reasons. They have a ton of resources on community building and community design in general, which I think will just like make us a stronger community as a whole. Um, they do have app functionality, so just ease of use once you become a member. Um, have like your standard capabilities of one-on-one -on -one chats, group chats, discussions, course building, polling and surveying the community, live streaming right within the platform, um, hosting virtual events within the platform, then event management for IRL. Um, and eventually, we'll talk about this in a minute, um, if we move towards um, having a token or an NFT for membership, it does have that capability, which I think helps bridge the gap um, in, into the Web3 space. Um, so we do have a quick demo that Antonio will take us through. Yeah, this is the, the page you get in once you're signed up. You get the welcome list on your right. That's just some suggestions that we have for you to just be familiar with the platform and to with everyone that's already in the platform. Uh, we got the feed where it's like all the news and all the chats and everything that's happening on the community. And then we kind of divided it in three spaces, the general, the Web3 noobs to Web3 gurus and the Web3 topics. The general is just like the name the general thing that every community and every platform has like the start here and the news about the community then we got the web3 noobs to web3 gurus that's like the more educational part of the, the community where everyone can attend workshops got some recommendations on podcasts books everything we got this example here for the set up your first web3 wallets it's a virtual event and then finally, we got the Web3 topics where we divided by fashion, art, music. It can be a, a lot of topics. We can keep adding those. And inside of each one, we can talk about specific teams that you're either working on or you need help with or just, or, I don't know, want to improve something about it. And so you just share news or whatever you want to do it. So uh, what's next for Web3 Noobs? We're hoping to develop some strong frameworks to make it a very interactive and engaging community. I think the only way that this can be successful is if people are actually wanting to jump on the platform, share, collaborate. So making it easier for people to do that um, will be one of the first things that we do. And uh, the content, we believe the content is one of the most important things besides the people. Uh, we got some, uh, we got a database of some content ideas that we want to create and we wanted to pull on the chats and all that. Uh, we got uh, the community engaged to create that content. So we want to reach out to the Web3 gurus to host either workshop or just start conversations or teach something on the platform. And then growing our membership. So just sharing with our current communities, with the PLN, with our LinkedIn communities, um, creating a referral program within the platform, um, some general marketing initiatives, um, one including uh, creating a Twitter profile to kind of share what's going on within the community. And in the future, just transition into a DAO, just figure out how to evolve the community into a DAO and create a token or the NFT membership just possibly get something that uh, you can transfer for for another members or something like that. And the most important thing that we kind of want to achieve is just create a kind of an incubator of a way to fund projects and to like collaborate with people that are non-technical with technical and just join the founders of the technologies. So yeah, if join us, if you're a founding member and you want to, help us and be a better tester and yes, let's all be web three gurus <laughs> still in early stages but it would be great if you would like to join thank you thank you awesome yeah thanks caitlin thanks antonio um again another another example of um identifying an opportunity a need um something that i don't think uh I'm unaware that something uh, of something that like this that currently exists. So um, nice, nicely done. And let's see where this goes. I think there, you know, we have people coming through Launchpad all the time who uh, I feel like this would be a community that they would 
like to be part of. And um, those of you who are coming in or who did come into Launchpad with um, feeling on the less technical side of things, this would provide a bit of a community um, for you to join and um, feel feel connected to Web3 and, and, and sort of empathize and, and grow with that community. Um, so thanks a lot. Um, up next, we've got Emma. I'm, I believe Emma was unable to join, just scrolling through here. I'll just leave this on the screen for a second. You can kind of read through what her goal was with or is with Polyrap. Is Temi Lalua here? So from our project I worked on, MLOps on IPFS kind of as like an experiment to see how can we improve the machine learning um, pipeline. So this is a big problem. So McKinsey estimates that by 2030, the global impact of uh, machine learning, AI, and automation will be more than $13 trillion. So this has been on everybody's mind from OpenAI to um, Google's bar that was just released. Everybody's thinking about AI machine learning. And it's only gonna have a bigger impact over the next few years to come. But to me, it's not just the economic impact, it's also the impact it'll have on different systems, including business and government. Especially when you think about some of these areas like public resources, healthcare, and infrastructure. When we're shooting for innovation in these areas, how can we still have innovation, but not sacrifice transparency so that people can feel like they understand what's happening and the stakeholders understand you know, how these models are being developed? So machine learning has a pretty long life cycle. The average person probably doesn't think about this, but from the time you're starting to collect the data, then you're training your model, you're packaging your model so they can be deployed. And then once it's deployed, you need to monitor it to see how is it doing in production. So it's a pretty lengthy process and it continues to go on. It's not like a you know, one stop, um, but the part that I wanted to focus on for this experiment was the monitoring part. So this would look like once a model is deployed into production and as um, improvements are being made to the model that the everyday citizen will be able to go to um, you know, IPFS link and be able to see the changes in the model in real or near to real time. So this is why I you know, circled it with the red circle. So the part I wanted to focus on with public services. So this is a really interesting case study to me especially in California and San Francisco. So just in last year alone, like literally just on the library system, San Francisco spent more than $171 million just on public libraries. That's one city. So think about how much money is being spent across just the US along for all of the major cities and smaller cities and how much of these budgets are being um, allocated basically arbitrarily. <laughs> and there's no really data-driven insights to how this is happening, right? So to me, I think it's too important not to dig into this further and create more transparency and also have data-driven impacts into how these decisions are being made. So there's an open source uh, data, data set that was made available. It basically um, gathers all the the patrons data for checkouts and library usage and different branches they went to, they anonymize the data, and they make it available um, for anybody you know, who's curious about this data in California. I use this to make a model and then you know, do the next parts of the experiment. And in the data set, there are probably about more than 40,000 patrons um, before the data was clean. So it's a pretty good uh, size training data set. So the experiment that I um, explored um, was deploying the model like regular, but then seeing, you know, as you're updating the model, are you able to share the updated model uh, through IPFS? So the primary IPFS tools I use are IPFS Python kit. It's still pretty new, it's only a few months old. The HTTP, um, HTTP client and the API. And this is just a screenshot of the um, ranking models. So I'll dig into that a little bit in the video so I'm explaining it. So here's a video of the main parts of the project. So the first part of the project was the same for you know, any other machine learning project, exploring the data, seeing what trends um, were there, doing some exploratory data analysis. You can see here um, some of the different um, data features they had, like the age group above the patron. Uh, what was their home library? You know, how many times did they check out um, items in the library? How many times did they renew? 
And it seems kind of trivial at first, but one of the features that is really important was age. Age is a big determinant in a driving behavior for the patrons and also um, their library location. This could be a really good indicator in the future for how budget can be allocated per location for you know, the libraries in a data-driven way and not just because maybe somebody on a board or committee you know, likes a particular location. So I also looked at the feature importance to see, okay, what impact did all these different features have on each other? And also develop the model itself and did like a ranking, um, ranking of models um, through AutoML and then chose the top model and then exported that to see, you know, hey, how well were we able to get this to IPFS? So once the models are developed, you can see here, then there's a model leaderboard. I'm gonna skip forward a little bit. So exporting the model. So right here, once the model was saved, export the model you know, in your directory of choice, then um, integrating with IPFS through the IPFS um, Python toolkit, then scheduling it, that's through another library um, that's available in Python. Um, so once you have your API and all the information inserted, then you can have your model exported on schedule to your whatever IPFS known of choice. And so to me, I think this is, that's restarting for some reason. <laughs> to me, I think this is a really big improvement potentially for machine learning models is that it doesn't just have to be black box, right? So for the machine learning models that are pretty popular right now and the AI tools that are popular is very black box. People don't get to see like how the model's improving in real time, what's under the hood. They just know that it works, right? To me, this is just a you know beginning um, solution um, to what I think could be a completely transparent pipeline for machine learning models. And I wanna to continue to work on this and have an interactive dashboard to show the models as it's growing. So that, okay, like, hey, if you're, if you're a taxpayer in San, San Francisco, you can go onto their um, city hall page and be able to see, okay, well, this is the model that we're using for the budget right now. And here's that model growing in real time. I think it would make um, not just governments, but also businesses more accountable to how they're um, driving um, budgets and how that has an impact on you know, organizations. So the reason why this is important is this will allow real-time transparency and, and pipeline openness, increase access for stakeholders, and improve budget allocation with data-driven outcomes. And the goal for this is to have machine learning available for the masses, right? Not just for all of the techies and nerds, you know, everyday people who want to understand what's happening and why it have an impact on their lives. But yeah, thanks for listening to me. Awesome. Another project that's identified kind of a unique problem and opportunity at the same time. Um, very cool. Thanks, Timmy Lua. Cool. Um, Jason's up next. Let's play this video. Hey, all. Sorry, I can't be there today. But uh, here's my uh, update on my project. Um, I'm backing up uh, Web3 uh, Web data into Web3. Um, so the general idea is, is that we're going to be reading from an S3 event stream and convert that into Filecoin deals, store that into Filecoin so that, you know, should something happen with the primary site, you can always restore it. There's other cool things you can do there with tiering, you know, kind of treat Filecoin as a glacier and stuff like that. Um, in this situation, we're going to be using Estuary as the buffer and deal maker. Um, and then you know, the, the big question is, can you get it back? What's the, what does that tooling look like and how that how, how does that all work? Um, and, you know, my, my plan is for now to do it all manually. Um, and so uh, I've got something working that's reading off of the event stream here. You can see an example of a uh, log message from from, from it. Um, I'm using MinIO and Kafka uh, to mock out the S3 server, um, and that then copies that data down using the S3 API, uploads it into Estuary using the Estuary API, um, and it's filtering right now for just the object puts. It's not handling any 
tagging updates or deletes or any of that stuff yet. Um, it prepends the bucket name onto the key so that it has, you know, some sort of hierarchy there. So you can, when you're going in, then hunting for the file, you know what file name you're you're after. Um, and then, yeah, it's pushing it up in, into Estuary. Um, I've noticed it takes a very long time for deals to complete. Um, and when we were there at um, the Cola week, it took about two days for me to get deals uh, validated on the network. Um, since then, I've done a couple more, and, and they've gone through much quicker um, in, the, in the range of hours now, uh, so not days, m much better. Um, but, you know, the tooling with Estuary is a little cumbersome. Um, I would like to have a little more control over it, so eventually I'm thinking of pulling that into the process uh, itself, um, doing the deal making then just with um, uh, Lotus directly and generating my own car files and buffering into like a IPFS light node that just runs in process. Um, and then, you know, here's the, here's the questions that we still have left that I haven't gotten to yet. Um, pulling the data back out, I have a suspicion that it's probably going to be easier to just pull the car file down and unpack it manually as well. Write a small little Go program to, you know, say, hey, this is the file that I want out of it and all that kind of stuff. Um, I kind of punted on all the metadata storage. Of course, that's very important if you lose your primary site and kind of want to make sure that all your tags and, you know, uh, if the customer has modified the e-tag on the object and stuff, that that all gets preserved and comes back with it. So how do you store that? How do you represent that? Doing either a IPL, a custom IPLD format or just throw it in a JSON object next to it, pros and cons of each. Um, figuring out some sort of deployment for this. Um, there's some Helm charts out there already for the estuary uh, and Lotus and, and stuff, um, but I really haven't taken a look at them. Um, so we need to figure that out. Um, and then, you know, wrap it all up with some metrics so we get some nice graphing and alerting and all that kind of stuff on it. But that's where I'm at. Um, again, sorry I couldn't be there, but uh, have a good one. Later. Awesome. I'm glad that he was able to um, to get that video posted and share what uh, he was working on. Um, yeah, great name. Might need to, like I said in, in the chat, maybe we need a, an award for some of these names. They're pretty creative. And... Let's move on to Laura. Yes. Um, all right. So I kind of took a Matthew-like approach and started with a little bit of education. Um, you can go ahead to the next slide, Dave. Um, so just to kind of give a little bit of background, um, I know that you all know that my team has recently launched a new video series called Founders because I simply refuse to stop talking about it. So I won't go too far into that. Um, but what you might not know is kind of the inner workings of a campaign. Um, so I'm going to talk about that for a little bit before getting into my project. Um, so basically for every public facing video you see, there is a little hamster tunnel wheel of weird videos behind it that you don't see as the consumer. So we're A-B testing almost everything. So we have shorter clips, longer clips, clips with copy that align with like this audience versus this audience. We have a different intro here. In between every time we release a video, we're taking that data and we are seeing how we can optimize the next leg of the campaign. Um, so to take that further, um, you can go to the next slide, Dave. To get even like kind of into the nitty grittier here, um, my team's KR1 is to develop and distribute excellent content um, with the goal of growing our follower bases across PL channels. Um, so these are our actual KPIs for the year. Um, as you can see, we surprised and delighted ourselves by reaching our Twitter growth goal last week for the whole year uh, using this campaign. So what that tells us is that the campaign is working on Twitter. Don't touch it, let it work. Those mechanisms are good. On LinkedIn and YouTube, we have room for optimization here. So that's kind of what I focused my project on. And now that we have a month of baseline data from the four videos that we've already released, we can use that data to optimize the next leg of the campaign. 
Um, next slide, please, Dave. So kind of the standout metric that stood out to me when we were looking at this first leg of data is that we have a standout audience among our three audiences. So a little more insight here. For this campaign, we have three target audiences. We have Web3 builders. Those are developers. Those are people who work in the Web3 space. Then we have founders. These are more like they're following YC. They're following Mark Rubin. They are achieving product market fit. And then we have end users, which is kind of an experimental audience that we're testing. Um, and these are people who were somehow connected to institutions like NASA, CERN, MIT, Stanford Research. Um, so that's kind of our experimental audience. Um, but we found that our standout audience here is the founders. Um, and what I mean when I say standout audience is they have the lowest cost per acquisition. So what that tells us is that there are a lot of people <clears throat> in this audience that have not yet converted to a PL user. So they are efficient and cheap to talk to. And then they also have the highest view rate and the highest engagement rate. So this is a marriage made in heaven because the most efficient, cheap people to reach are the people who are showing the most interest in PL's content. So I thought, how do we make some sort of series that is a little more targeted towards this group that we can test out um, that isn't going to cost us anything because our big production budgets for the rest of the year are already committed. Um, so you can go to the next slide, Dave. I was thinking back to when we interviewed all these founders in Lisbon and we asked all of them, if you could give advice to a new founder, what would you say? And then I promptly cut that footage out of pretty much everyone's final interview because it just wasn't flowing correctly with the rest of the information. So I asked our editors, go get that footage and let's make a new little short series so that we can test with this new priority audience. Um, and so we kind of bundled it in two different formats. So we have one format that is more targeted for a LinkedIn paid media campaign. You can see it. It looks a little bit different. And then we're also piloting on YouTube Shorts. Um, and obviously, we chose these two platforms because they are the ones that we are trying to invest in to make sure that we hit our KPIs for the year. Um, and the reason we want to pilot on shorts is because it's a new feature on YouTube. And basically, anytime a platform is rolling out a new feature, you want to test it out because the platform itself is going to prioritize accounts that are interacting with new features because they want users to adopt their new features. So we needed a shorts test anyway. I wanted to test with this new audience. And this basically cost us nothing because we already have a motion agency on retainer and uh, we're launching on Tuesday. So keep an eye out for this. And then the process starts over. We get data back and we'll uh, keep iterating on it. Awesome. Very cool. Um, looking forward to seeing the release on Tuesday and, uh, and where this goes. Um, and that's, I mean, I, I really like that data and, uh, you shared earlier. It sounds like you're crushing it on LinkedIn. Um, Twitter. And tw oh, was it Twitter? Is that what you said? Twitter is where we're crushing. Twitter. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I'm sure, I'm sure the others will follow shortly. Um, so looking forward to seeing how that develops. Um, let's see up next. We got Ishan. Is Ishan on? Yeah. Okay, hey everyone, I'm Aslan from Function Land. Uh, if you go to the next. Sure. So I, I just want to like elaborate on the problem that we are solving with an example. Like you, let's say you've been using a service like Google Photos for 10 years, putting your images there, and Google decides to now charge you $140 a year. Switching to another service is not that easy, probably impossible, because right now these service providers, they lock in our data they don't provide us as an easy way to own our data. It's like an early days of gaming, you know, like where when you had to switch the whole Pac-Man machine to add a game. And then these gaming cartridges came to decouple the game from the machine. So now if you go to the next slide, we, we are thinking like of a new way to give the ownership of the data back to the users to decouple the data from the service that we use, which creates this competition among service providers. We no longer are, are locked into Google. 
a small provider can create a better Google Photos alternative and we can simply switch. It makes it cheaper for users because it increases the, the competition. And also now those service compet providers are not like locked into using data that are on Google. So it increases the revenue for them as well. Uh, if you go to the next slide, and it's like, like what, is it, what we created called crowd storage, which is powered by this set of protocols we call FULA. So it's like a P2P decentralized data storage protocol that allows users to share their unused storage on their devices with each other. So let's say, uh, and we, we are actually segregating the network into pools. So let's say I'm in Toronto, I join a pool in Toronto. Within this pool, there are 200 people who we share our storage with each other. I back up the data of like, some people in this pool, they back up my data. And each piece of file is basically backed up with a replication factor of three on the network so that if a few of them goes down, I still have access to my data. Uh, can you go to the next slide? And also like now that we are giving the data back to the users, we can, and, and creating this decentralized network, we can add the power of blockchain to it. So transactions that can happen to monetize this network for developers. And the way it happens, it, it monetizes for developers is when a developer creates an application, let's say like this Photos app, users pay the developer with tokens uh, directly. So like no middleman in between, users earn tokens from sharing a storage with the other and pay those developers. And so, so traction wise, we, we actually, we have a hardware. We sold about 900 of those hardwares globally. So we have nodes, uh, more than one petabyte of a storage initially when we go live. We are now shipping right now uh, those nodes and we created two dApps uh, and FX files and FX photos, which is gonna be replacing Google files and Google photos. They are available on Google Play and Apple Store. And uh, if you go to the next slide, and this is our stack. So we are heavily based on IPFS. So we use WinFS, which is created by uh, Fusion Labs. To, to actually encrypt the data on the client, shard the data, send the shards through our protocol, which is based on lip P2P and GraphSync to the, to, the, to the backend network and back it up on the backend network and access it basically on this local pool. And uh, can you go to the next slide? Uh, if you play this video, like it's a short demo of how FX photos connect with the backend, uh, is it playable? And uh, can you go to the settings and maybe just increase the speed to, to 1.5 because it's, thank you. So yeah, so like you, you basically log in with any anything, like you can even log in with Google. We, we just use that login to create your DID, like a, a key. So uh, you log in, that's your DID on the app, you add, your your backend actually this is now improved you don't have to add the address like this this was the previous version now yeah like we 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 we, we added like a, a announcement that it automatically takes your backend so now like you, you get this this interface this is a mobile application so this is like we are focused on mobile applications not browser based applications and you can you see, like you can upload the photo, it gets encrypted, transferred to the back end. Uh, can you go to the next? I'm not sure if that's the last one or, oh yeah. And this is the team like me, K1, we are software developers and Massey actually, and we have like tokenomics leads and graphic designers, hardware designers in the team as well. Thank you. Uh, that's awesome. Um, thanks for sharing. And oh yeah, uh, I didn't know Masi was working on this. He uh, he's hosted a number of awesome um, Q and A sessions uh, for Launchpad in the past. So um, I'll have to uh, have to tell him that I I heard about this now that uh, now that I know he's on the team. Uh, thanks for sharing. Andre's up next. I saw earlier he had to hop off. Andre shared a bit, I think, with uh, of this um, project idea with us in Denver, um, map of technological opportunities. Um, 
I'll just leave this on the screen for a second. You can read through what his project goal was and some of the challenges. So congratulations, everybody. Thanks again for sharing those. Um, I know that it can seem a little burdensome to be having to work on a project showcase um, after, you know, after we sort of lose a bit of the momentum at post colo week and, and um, you're getting pulled in other directions by your teams. But um, I think it's really awesome to see all the creative um, contributions and ideas that you're coming up with. Um, and congratulations, you are now uh, reached the end of your launch pad journey. Um, there's a couple of slides here I'd like to run through just before we, we wrap. Um, you are entering, uh, launching into the, uh, the network. Uh, many of you have, have been in the network for a while, but uh, now you've completed Launchpad. Um, if you also completed all of the pre-test and end of section tests within the curriculum, um, we're working on uh, rolling out some learning credentials um, as kind of a something tangible that um, you can take with you to show that you've completed Launchpad and you've completed this four-week journey of, of learning about um, Protocol Labs Tech, Web3, the network. Um, and once we have the credentials ready to go, those will be shared with you based on um, the fact that you have completed all the requirements of the program. In terms of awards that you will receive uh, in the near future, um, please take a second to vote on all of the presentations that we've heard um, today. Um, there, these will be announced probably tomorrow. Uh, yeah, tomorrow um, we used to do it at our final weekly sync. We don't have a weekly sync tomorrow. So it will be announced on our Filecoin Slack channel. Um, you can vote. Um, I think you're only, you log in, you vote once. Uh, you can vote for the same presentation for more than one award if you'd like. It's just a drop down list. Um, all of the presentations should be on there. If there's any issues accessing the form or you notice something's missing, please uh, Slack me. Uh, but awards will be given for the biggest contributions to existing projects, most impactful technical contribution, most exciting project, the best presentation, best collaborative effort, the most likely to be used, and the most valuable, the MVPL, most val valuable for PL. Um, so please take a second to open up the link, uh, scan that QR code, or in uh, the showcase deck, you can click on that vote here link at the bottom, and um, we'll tab those uh, votes up later and announce the winner is tomorrow. And now the future is all in your hands. Go forth, um, continue to be awesome, and create uh, these great contributions that we've seen previews of today. And um, it's been an awesome uh, few weeks working with you all. Uh, I hope we stay connected, and I look forward to uh, to seeing you online and in person at future um, network events. Um, so thank you all. Thank you all. Yeah, actually, thanks, Kyle, for mentioning this. Um, thanks for the the thanks. You're you're all overly generous, but a lot of this praise needs to go to the the people who are not in front of the camera, who are on the Launchpad team that make this possible. Um, you know, I'm just the the face here, um, and so uh, thank you to the the team. Um, and I think that brings our showcase to a close. Thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. Um, have a great weekend, and uh, I'm sure I'll see you all somewhere soon, hopefully. Thanks a lot.